So um, this is this is another conversation we're having around the theme and topic of what it means to live well as an artist or creative in the world today. My name is Andrew Macklin. I'm an actor and a creative career coach. I work with people, artists and creatives all across the art sector and in the creative industries, but helping me unravel the Gordian knot of what it means to live well in the world today as a creative is, is John Hartock. John Hartock, I just want to say, hey, thank you, it's a real, it's a real delight to see you. It's been quite some time since I've seen you in the flesh, so to speak, even if it is over Zoom. Um, and for those who might not know, John, you, you do more things than I have fingers to count on. Uh, creatively, um, John is, you are an occasional poet to use your own description, a musician, actor, director, storyteller, acting coach. You were the head of acting at the world-renowned Bristol Ovic Theatre School for, I'll have to ask you for how long. Um, and, and that is you in, in a kind of nutshell, unless there's any additions you'd like to make to that, John, that I haven't added in there. Uh, I have, out of respect to my colleagues, say that I was the head of acting courses. There was a separate, uh, a separate appointment as head of acting. Thanks for the clarification. Um, the idea was, the idea was that the uh, that the acting side of things, like the stage management side of things, could be divided into um, uh, in, into whatever you call it, boards or whatever. So we, so you've got the head of music and singing, you've got the head of movement and dance, and you've got the head of acting, and then above them comes the head of acting courses, basically. So that was my job. And how, if you don't mind me asking, how long were you working at the Bristol Olympic Theatre School? If anybody who sees this is old enough to remember Round the Horn, they will remember Kenneth Williams played a character whose, whose punchline, his tagline was 35 years. Uh, and that was how long I was at Bristol full time. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you about this specifically is, uh, well, two reasons really, I guess. One, because of your own sort of creative journey and the multiplicity of the things that you, you do, you explore and that you still perform. Um, but also the other was to do with the fact that you had this perspective, I think, for a generation of actors, if not more, at, at a very early point in their careers before going out into, into the industry. You, you started this, this wonderful journey as, as an actor. Um, and I wonder, yeah, one thing that's been really interesting in the people that I've, I've, I've talked with and worked with so far is, yeah, yeah, when did you intuitively know that you wanted to go into acting professionally? Yeah, it is quite difficult because obviously in childhood you start doing things, you get given parts to play, etc, etc. You start to like it, it feels comfortable. You realise you're better at it than some of the other people around for whatever reason. Um, I think I had, I'd, I said I wanted to be an actor, I suppose probably 17, 18, somewhere around then. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I was told, of course, it's a most terribly insecure profession, you know, get a degree. Because in those days, people say, if you've got a degree, you can always teach. Um, which you could in those days, and I did in fact. Um, but uh, then I went to university, so I went to university to get a degree. Um, and as a, a, a boy from a um, from a very small Lincolnshire village and a small community, moving into <clears throat> a, a university where I was um, I was measuring myself against people of similar talent and similar. enthusiasms um, and finding that I measured up to them 
-hmm. So I, in, you're, you're talking about intuition. The intuition, I suppose, was there beforehand, but it was rather had water, cold water poured on it by this advice that very few people made a living at acting and blah, blah, blah. And it was at university when um, I found myself with people of sort of similar abilities that I realized I could measure up um, and that it would be, I would be able to have a, a decent go at following what was by then a dream. But even then I held back. I was very cautious, always have been rather cautious, I think. Uh, even then I held back and it wasn't until uh, somebody else who was working in the amateur company that I was in after I'd left, uh, after I'd left university, um, when somebody else got into a drama school, mm -hmm. that I thought, oh gosh, this is the call. You know, this is life saying to me, if he can do it, you can bloody well do it. Pick up your courage and go for it. Um, Bristol had auditioned me and accepted me before any of the other drama schools had even given me a date for an audition. So I just went with it and I loved it. Wow, God. Uh, and so, I mean, you said you were in, you'd gone to university before moving into Bristol. Was that, was that right? Before going to drama yeah. school? Yeah, I was at Keele University, which in, in those days was a particularly exciting place because it was a four year course. Um, and the first year was broadly entitled The History of Western Civilization. So they were trying to create Renaissance men and women. Uh, and um, they did their best. They've had to abandon that course since because I don't think it was financially viable. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, a, again, it was an incredibly idealistic place. Uh, and, um, uh, and it gave one the feeling that one, as a, as a, a humanity student, you could talk to scientists, you could you know, you, you could understand a little bit about other things. Um, uh, and uh, it, was, it was a fantastic place to be. I mean, it, it sounds like the kind of university that a university is meant to be. From what yeah, I've read universities. It is, was, yeah. And there was something really interesting you were saying there about, <clears throat> well, this comes up a lot, I think, that there's an, an instinctive sort of interest that is sort of early on in someone's art or, or, or what they want to do. And then the sort of the voice of authority in some form that says, <clears throat> look, you know, the structuring parents saying, you want to be a little bit careful with this, it's a little, little tricky. Uh, for you, it sounds like then it went to, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it was like, um, it was the social proof, being amongst peers and seeing someone else get in, that as you said, allowed you to pick up your courage and, and go with it. But it, it brought another question to mind, which comes up quite a lot. And especially with acting, there's that statistic, isn't there? There's the 98% are unemployed and 98% yes. are unemployed at any, at any given time. And yet, and yet quite a few people knowing that carry on. And, and you were one of those. So you knew the statistics or you knew the sense from that parental voice kind of saying or that authority voice saying you know this isn't this isn't gonna this might not work out well <laughs> this, the, yeah. this, this statistic <laughs> against you. so f for you what was how did you reason your way around that mm. good question i just had i think that confidence of youth by the time by the time I knew that I could measure myself against other people in the university and still be <clears throat> at the same sort of level as I felt I was when I was, you know, when I was at school, you know, I was still sort of at the top percentage of people doing it. Um, I think my confidence was high. Um, I'd never wanted to be uh, a soldier but I think it's the same thing. <laughs> the young men in 1914 all felt fairly optimistic when they went over the top, so we're told. Um, and I was sort of quite ready to wave my metaphorical revolver in the air and go over the top, you know. <laughs> That's... And I've been over the top ever since, some people would say. <laughs> <laughs> That is an image, though. I, I don't know. That, that sort of rings a bell for me, at least. There's definitely a, or I can recognise as well, that sense of 
there's something about maybe being 18, 21 or whatever, and that sense of maybe having not been through a war or two <laughs> and that enthusiasm yeah. of going over the top, not knowing there's a unique confidence there that maybe enables that. Yeah. Um, so obviously you, you went to the, the world renowned Bristol Vic Drama School, as, as we know. Um, how was it when you left? There's a big transition, obviously, as I'm sure you are familiar with both from doing it and from seeing students do it for years. There is that transition between, yeah, the, the, the amateur to the professional almost, the I'm in training, I'm thinking I'm playing, to I'm now going into an industry. Mm. How, <clears throat> how did you see that at the time for you? I think the first, the first thing is just when you get into it and start, you know, start training, you realize very quickly that you can't just wing it in the way that you used to as an amateur. So a little bit of the sort of rock and roll type pleasure goes out of it. You have to regain that, I think. Um, and then you've got to be quite careful, I think, and I have said this to students, that you don't lose your talent by becoming a good student. When you go from training into the outside world in those days, you know, we're talking about 1974 when I left, there was no showcasing. There were, you know, the occasional agent used to come by as a sort of shadowy figure. We used, I think, to get... No, I don't think we did. <clears throat> we didn't even get interviewed by sort of agents who were asked or paid to come in and, and, and put us, give us the once over um, in those days. Uh, it was more, you know, one... God, one was going to get into the Bristol Old Vic Company, and I didn't, and that was a huge disappointment to me. Um, and then what do you do? And it was, you know, there was none of the, the showcasing, the, uh, the links with casting directors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that we get nowadays, that, that drama schools do nowadays. Um, <clears throat> I got <clears throat> through writing letters. Um, we were meant to write 300 letters. I don't think I wrote 300 letters. I don't think I wrote more than about 20. Um, I got two auditions. One turned out to be with somebody who was about to leave for Australia the following week and was therefore of no use, but he saw me, nice chap. Um, the other one was with Coventry Belgrade Repertory Theatre and that went very well, but it took them, I think, three months to decide whether they wanted me or not. They kept looking, as theatre companies do and did, uh, kept looking to see if they could get anything better. <laughs> it's a great compliment. Um, uh, and when I used to phone up and say, any news, you know, they used to say to me, well, you know, if, if somebody else offered you a job, John, then, uh, then we'd have to make our minds up, wouldn't we? But, but actually, as it is, we're still auditioning. So anyway, they gave me the job eventually. Um, so that was sort of one out of one, really. Um, and I don't know what I'd have done. You know, if I hadn't done that one, I'd have dragged on. When I became unemployed for the first time <clears throat> after that job, the principal at the theatre school uh, sort of made a couple of phone calls and I then got a, a second job out of that. Um, and then Coventry asked me back for the following season. So, so that, that sort of, and then I met people there who essentially offered me a job elsewhere later on. So I went there and I stayed there a long time. And almost by that time, it was time to <laughs> give up and start teaching. Uh, <clears throat> that came because my wife was ill. Um, and we, by that time, we had three children. And there was no way that I could do the vagabond thing around the countryside um, for not much money. Um, and I needed something steady to support the family. Um, and I then started banging on the door of the theatre school and saying, give me a job. I mean, which they did. It's, it's sort of fascinating to hear you describe that those first steps professionally after drama school. And because what's really interesting is I think for so many artists or creatives or actors, it's, it's unpredictable. And it seems to be from what you were describing, this emergent thing of 
well, you know, I, I had, I wrote two letters. Uh, I managed to get in the door. Uh, principal of the drama school helped as well. And there was more work that came off this. Um, in, in, in the early stages, in those first couple of years when you're working as an actor, what was, what did you discover was really exciting about it? Mm. Almost everything, really. Um, sense of, a sense of esprit de corps, of being part of a group of people who weren't quite in the mainland line of society, a sort of bohemian quality mm -hmm. to life, working odd times and odd hours, the discipline, the idea, as I say, it's pretty cool, the, 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 the idea that our disciplines were different from other people's, but they were very strict and very much there. Um, there was a, there's a sort of pride in it. Um, uh, yeah, I might not be earning as much as you, but I'm an actor, mate. You know? <laughs> um, uh, I enjoyed the company, the companies I, I, I played with. I enjoyed the contact with um, older actors, with writers, with directors, with people more experienced, which in those days, because I was working in rep, was, you know, it was more common, I think, nowadays than uh, as a starting point. In those days, it's probably worth saying that the casting director of drama at the BBC had a rule that she wouldn't consider anybody for work at the BBC in BBC drama unless they'd had five years experience in rep um, so no doubt they had to use children and things like that but uh, things like that sorry children people people of that ilk still sounds contentious doesn't it no doubt they had to use children uh, um, uh, but um, and they wouldn't have had that experience but basically you know going in as a young actor she would talk to you and then say uh, but basically but you knew when you went in that she'd be looking at your next five years from a distance, um, but you weren't going to get work mm -hmm. from them. I mean, did I answer that question? I can't remember what it was. I, what was it? I, th yeah. I think so. what you did. It was, it yeah, was, it was rep. It was it was rep, and it was exciting, and it was exciting, sort of moving around the country. It was even exciting at the beginning. I'm not sure how long it would have, you know, if I'd gone on doing it for a long time, how 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 soon it would have pulled. But it was quite exciting finding incredibly cheap digs um, and uh, and meeting strange landlords and landladies and people landladies in those days I don't know what it's like now but theatre landladies who were who were just wonderful wonderful people and and you know their lives were often their actors you know their poor old husbands would go off to work at the at, at, at um, Cowley or wherever um, and uh, can't remember her name Mrs Pugh I can't remember her her, um, her Christian name, but anyway, Mrs. Pugh would just look after the actors. You get lovely food, and you know they would look after you if you came in drunk. They look after you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> they're, they're still very much in existence. Uh, I, Are I, they? Good. I can say from Good. personal experience, yeah, uh, I, and it's always interesting talking to people outside of <clears throat> theatre because the idea that you would <laughs> be professionally required to stay in the house. <laughs> Of a random stranger while working yeah. is is yeah. mind-boggling to people outside of, to, in any other industry they're like well why isn't there a hotel um but it seems to add to that variety and that excitement like you were saying and i really recognize what you mentioned around that sense of i think maybe it must, must be true for a lot of artists maybe or creatives we haven't discussed whether actors are artists <laughs> i know we spoke a little about that earlier um but the, the, that sense of pride that comes with <clears throat> I may not be making a lot of money, but I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I want in my own sort of yeah. own way. Yeah, um, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll get onto the artist one. In, you but know, I am being paid for it. I think that's the other thing. I may not be earning a lot of money, but I'm doing what I want. I am being paid for it, you know, uh, which is the, that's the achievement, isn't it? Somebody's actually, actually mad enough to give you money for what you would do for free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's, an, yes, yeah, that's an essential point, isn't it? Um, so on that topic then, which is, I guess, controversial one around, you know, what, what is an artist, what is a creative, is an actor an artist? What's, wh where do you stand on that today? Well, it's interesting that you started using this word creative, which of course isn't, isn't it hasn't been part of my vocabulary. Now, creative as a noun, meaning creative people, you know, 
uh, creative person. Um, that hasn't been part of my vocabulary. And it's quite interesting that it is something that can bridge that gap be between art and craft. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we were talking earlier about, about the difference between art and craft, and actually creative bridges that gap very beautifully, and you don't have to distinguish between the two. And we were talking about this business of, you know, the difficulty of using words to define something, but then, but then suddenly the word starts to become more important than the thing itself when you start using the word to make boundaries around the thing mm -hmm. and art craft creativity etc is something which of its very nature says please don't put any boundaries around me mm -hmm. um but there was a definition that i i mentioned to you earlier on which was by the ex-principal of the theatre school chris dennis who who actually said acting is a craft which at its highest level sometimes becomes an art and i think there's a lot of wisdom in that first of all don't be ashamed of having a bloody being a bloody good craftsman i mean i think that's really really important um and that's one of the schools one of the things that drama schools can teach i don't think they can teach art i don't think they can teach you to be an artist if there's not an artist inside you they can teach you craft and craft can get you by a lot of the time and craft you know a good craftsman is is worth their weight you look at the people the medieval craftsmen whose names we don't know who carved the stone in cathedrals and etc etc and you think my god fantastic um so you know craftsmanship is is is, is extremely vulnerable it's extremely valuable and very vulnerable probably um um, my, my thought there is that how much are you an originator? I think an artist is an originator. An artist, I'm thinking about painters perhaps now, takes what is on the outside, the photographic vision of something, and then interprets it in a way that is personal to them and which they which is shared enough by other people for it to become a mode of communication in itself and the artist i think is the originator of that sort of communication so traditionally you start with a writer who has an idea who wants to express that idea and needs actors to do it and the actors come along and it is feasible, though perhaps not very likely, that their, that their attitudes could be completely different from that of the writer. And yet, for whatever reason, possibly because they're being offered money, they, they, will, uh, they, will, they will hitch their wagon to that writer for a while and help that writer often through the media, uh, the mediumship or whatever of, of a director, producer, director or whatever, um, and designers and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, to give that writer the chance to make that communication as complete and as positive as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think the basic job of an actor is. Then, of course, you get actors who, for one reason or another, create their own plays, write their own plays, devise their own plays, etc., etc. At which point, they are crossing the boundary between craftsmanship and art, and they are part of the creators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that feels like a really sort of clear distinction you're making there around the actor crafts person as a sort of someone who facilitates the process of of right of the writer's intentions towards performance and then a sort of a crossing point when an actor either decides to write something originate as you say or 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 improvise and create something in in, in that way that does sound sort of i guess quite clear and yeah creative seems to I guess incorporate quite quite a few of those different ways in which people might might act and think. It just occurred to me you were talking about 
definitions and falling between words and the, and the boundaries that those definitions create, which are, I think are, are, are really useful and can serve quite well in sort of that pride about what you do, knowing what that is. Um, with those boundaries and those sort of ideas and definitions about what you are and what you do, I mean, how, how do you think that can limit people? I don't know. I guess it's it's it's. Yeah, you, you gave a long list of the things I do at the beginning. You could have said, and I'm beginning to like this word now, you could have said John is a creative, which would have which would have sort of encapsulated all those things really. And 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 what and I I'm not I'm quite I have been quite happy to be called an actor. I'm really, but I'm really uncomfortable with being defined most of the time. <laughs> um, and so if you say I'm a creative, I st <laughs> slightly <laughs> wince at the word, but if you say I'm a creative, if you say I'm a craftsman, if you say I'm an artist, you are in, in a sense using terms that embrace particularly artist and creative, you're, you're, you're giving yourself the right, aren't you, mm. to say, I have a creative nature, and if I happen to be writing a piece of verse, or if I happen to be writing a play, or if I happen to be teaching people to create, if I happen to be performing in some way or other, those are terms which don't actually confine me. Mm -hmm. Does that come close to? Oh yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have a. I mean, it's a really pointed question, uh, and so thanks for for wrangling with it. Uh, and I guess it's it's on my mind a lot because it's something that I guess I've come up against quite a lot. Against is another strong way of putting it, but um, quite often I meet people who will be an actor and will want to write, but won't feel like their, their definition as an actor allows them or gives them the capability to do it. Even, even writers who are, you know, published as writers will still have this identity of something else previous to it that seems to tug and restrict and be constantly there as well. I, I am this thing, I am an actor, and so I'm always sort of masquerading uh, as a writer when I write. Uh, I mean, the amount of times I would have heard the term imposter syndrome, um, which is interesting because everyone has a different definition of that, interestingly. But yeah, I, I guess for me it's in my head quite a lot because I, I notice it as being quite a limiting thing. Uh, sometimes it can give direction, you know, if, if you are a thing and you know where you want to you be and that, that allows a certain energy to go in a different direction then that can be a great thing to cling on, but it feels like, at least in, I guess, the creative industries or arts, it yeah. feels like more often than not, yeah. it can be a restricting thing. Yeah, I do have, I, perhaps a little springboard for that <clears throat> might be, uh, when I was at university, um, a guy from a couple of years ahead of me, I think, uh, graduated, and became uh, an assistant director in a theatre company. Um, and I wrote to him when I left university, I think, because there was the chance possibly then of getting an, I don't know, you could do these things, you could just about still do this thing called an acting ASM ship in which you, you got paid eight pounds a week and swept the stage and, and got to deliver letters on stage, you know. Um, and um, I wrote to him and I got this rather superior letter back saying, of course, uh, of course, we'll, we'll see you. We'd like to. But I had said that, which I did, that we, uh, at drama school, at the end of drama school, we were given a little form to fill in that said, how do you see your, 
your future? What would you like to do with it? And in, as part of that, I had said, well, I'd like to direct sometime and I'd like to teach sometime and et cetera, et cetera. And so I thought it was a good idea to outline to this guy who was on the path of directing um, what I, um, uh, what, what my vision of the future was. So I sent him all this and I got this note back saying, of course, we'll see you, but you must realize we're looking for actors, not writers, not directors. And at that time, certainly there was that, that wall came down. Uh, whether it was him saying, I don't want this guy interfering with what I do, <laughs> or, or, or whether it was just that he felt it was, they felt at that time it was a sort of wooliness um, that, uh, that suggested that you might be trying to get in as an actor, but what you really wanted to do was take over the entire theatre company or something like that, I don't know. Um, but that sense of being put in a box I do have a bit of imposter syndrome. I always call it the fear of being found out. Um, and, the, and, and that is there in me. Um, probably more about teaching than about anything else. Mm -hmm. um, but it is there, the, the sense, the, the fear of being found out to be crap and things like that. But I, I mean, it's, it was design in the sense that I wanted to do a number of different things, but it's, it's been coincidence that I've found myself in a position where I've been able to do that and where I've been able to not to have to um, conform to, uh, to a single definition because at the theatre school, when they needed a script writing, I could write a script. I've never been a great one for, I've only, I've only written, I think, one original script in my life. Um, <laughs> and the word originally, original could well be a, um, a misnomer. Um, but, but I used to adapt, and I used to love adapting. And it's like acting, because you start thinking, okay, now I'm Geoffrey Chaucer, or now I'm Alexandre Dumas, or now I'm Reddy Kipling. Uh, and, and you start writing, you start you start being slightly possessed by them as you might be by a role. And you start finding that you start to express yourself on paper at least like that person. And, and, and you think whether you're right or wrong, you think you're starting to think like that person. Um, and so it's not that much for me, it wasn't that much of a slide, but I was not writing original stuff. I was not being an artist, if you like. I was being a craftsman. I was not, I was not <coughs> writing something from in me that I wanted to communicate to the world. I was finding other people's um, communication interesting <coughs> and occasionally surreptitiously slipping a bit of my own voice into it. Um, but then, you know, <coughs> I did, when I was at, training at the school at the first, no, no, sorry, when I was teaching at the school in the first years, I was still doing radio work at Bristol because it was a big centre for radio drama there. So I, I, I was unable to do that. I had, to, I could keep up with the acting. I could do the teaching. I could, <coughs> um, uh, I could do a bit of writing. And then, you know, eventually the songs I was writing, I just wanted, I wanted to sing more. I wanted to play more. I'm still a very, very poor musician. You describe me as a musician. That was, a great compliment because I don't consider myself a musician. I'm a strummer. I'm a strummer. And I, I think I always will be. Haven't got the application to become a proper musician. Um, so, um, so there were, it was life, though it was difficult because I became a single parent and was looking after three children. The theatre school was a fantastically secure environment for me. I mean, who in our profession, who in any profession nowadays spends 35 years in the same job, you know? Um, it was, you know, it, it, was, it was fantastically secure and enabled me in a humble way to do a lot of different creative things. Because there was a salary check at the end of each month. Um, and because, frankly, I didn't have to put myself out there and face the possible rejection of these things. Um, and that 
if I think back, I was doing sort of all right as an actor. But if I think back to that and think, well, what would have made you leave the business if you'd gone on, if, you'd, if, if things hadn't happened the way they did and you'd gone on being an actor, it would probably be rejection, the sense of rejection that you have to learn to live with. When you're saying an actor has to be tough, it's a lot about not getting work that you think you can do well. <coughs> and then sometimes, let's face it, going along and seeing the result and seeing somebody else do the job that you wanted and thinking, well, they're not much good, so why didn't I get it? Am I, am I really not as good as that? <coughs> Yeah, yeah, the, the, the injustice of it. Um, you, you make some, yeah, really interesting points around, and there's a, a discussion to be had around the usefulness of, of stability and, and structure for creativity. I mean, it sounds like, from what you were saying about that stability that, that teaching at Bristol gave you, actually allowed you to kind of expand into your interests in a way that, had you pursued as a, your work as an actor, might not have had the same room for. And so there's, it feels like there's definitely an argument to be making around, well, actually stability can, can, can launch you creatively into, into other areas. Yeah, and rep, and rep did give you a certain amount of stability. I mean, the average rep contract was about three months, something like that, I think. So, so you had your time there. And I did, you know, when I was in rep, I did actually, if I was in a play, that um in which i didn't have a in which i had a small role for example which happened fairly frequently especially at the beginning of one's career um so i had time on my hands mm -hmm. so I, I would i would write i started writing the pantomime for example because i knew they wanted a pantomime so so you know i started writing that um i started doing um little concert things little little um one or two man uh recitals and things like that um but still, there was that basic element of security for a limited period of time that enabled me to have spare time to do that. Um, what I was very bad at was finding the next job, was, was actually realising that during the time that I was secure, it was going to come to a sharp, sudden end, mm -hmm. and that the security would end at that point, and that I should be trying to chase work, you know, right from the word go, mm -hmm. but I tended not to do yeah, I mean, it, that comes up a lot, the sort of hamster wheel effect for yeah. some actors in the, the constant sort of chasing after work aspect can sort mm -hmm. of, yeah, make, make, make other decisions, other things you might want to do quite, quite difficult. Um, I'm really interested in, it sounds like there was a, a clear pivot and change when you, well, it, it needed to be when you went to start teaching at Bristol, which has allowed you to expand into directing and writing and those other those other areas but when we refer to where you were at the beginning this sort of defined actor term um yeah those pivot points can be hard to manage for people in careers this idea of i have been this thing i've invested in being this thing now priorities have shifted and interests have shifted and other requirements and now I'm a, a, a new thing a teacher or a writer or a director so I'm always interested in those as in mm. how for you did you begin to manage that in the way that you saw yourself to to enable you to to go and do that to, to be a teacher in that way the theatre school used to ask for actors who were interested in doing some direction. In the first year, essentially you got taught more by actors than by directors, or directors who had, who had done some acting. Mm. So I went in as an actor interested in directing to pass on what I knew about the profession, which frankly wasn't very all that much. I'd only been in it five years and I don't think I was very good at my job at all at first, but I clung on to it. Um, for those five years, I was looking for an out. I was seeing it as 
a short term thing, not something I think I was irresponsible about. I, I enjoyed the work and I put what I could into it, though I was going through a difficult time um, in life. Um, but my idea was to step sideways and create something that would make money on the side so that I could once again return to the mainstream. It wasn't so much being an actor, it was being in the mainstream of the theatre as it was then, of the theatrical business, of the business. Um, becoming a teacher, you know, that old thing, those who can teach, those, you know, those who can do, those who can't teach, was, was it wouldn't hang around so much if, it, if there wasn't a niggling element of truth in it, and it's particularly true in our field, I think. It's not that they pe people who can't do it, but it's people who teach, but it's people who, who, who either can't do it or they gave it up because of the life or they couldn't get work, which is not the same, as you know, as not being able to do it. Um, but then they teach and the, that thing about I was once an actor sort of hangs over them all the time. I went to drama school or whatever it is, and this is what that's, that's in their sort of little local reputation. And that can become a sort of, when you meet people from the business, it can become a sort of uh, inferiority complex. When I went to Stratford a few years ago for a conference, um, I found myself talking to um, quite a famous actor uh, who was helping out with it. And I said, you know, is it very obvious the institutional inferiority complex that's around and she said yes absolutely um uh so this this business of not feeling your you know setting your sights on being professional on being good enough to be professional and then finding that you've had to take a step back now there's no doubt about it that at that, that time i thought of that as being a step back i did want to teach at some point in my life but i saw that as being you know later on when i'm the sort of age i am now not 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 at the beginning I wanted to have a, you know, a firework career first. Um, but it was to do with being in the business rather than just being an actor. So what I was doing, I, I, I adapted The Jungle Book. This was pure coincidence, really. Um, it came out of an idea which I'd read in stage. Somebody, an Israeli company, I think, or a Dutch company had actually been doing some work on, and I suddenly could do that. And I did it for an exercise with the students as a final, term exercise and we just took the book and we scribbled out bits and we got them doing things um, and then the principal asked me to take it on uh, to do a, a, a school's version of it the following year and I said on, on the on condition that you let me do it in the studio as a main house show if it works and it came into the studio as a main house show and the London production company saw it and we took it to the West End where it died the death. Um, but that was, you know, that was me hoping to build something out of which, which would give me the freedom not to have to stay at the theatre school all my life. Mm -hmm. um, as time passed, I got more and more interested in what I could do in the theatre school and in the confines of the theatre school um, and with the freedom of the theatre school. And so my attitude to that changed. What, what were those things? So, I mean, you, you described that. Oh, 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 big what thing, working with yeah. one of the things, one of the things we haven't said was that about the 80, age 18 or something like that, I thought there can't be much better than working with Shakespeare on a daily basis. And when I went into acting, I was very, very much trying to do at least one Shakespeare a year. That was one of the things I had in my head. And I sort of managed that um, during those, those brief five years. Um, and then um, coming to the theatre school, of course, it, it enabled me to work with him on a, on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's so exciting. And then to be able to pass that on to young people 
some people who were completely puzzled by um, Shakespeare um, and to try to break down the boundaries uh, between his language and their language and him and them. Um, and to, I think, you know, succeed in certain cases. Um, uh, so that was, a, that was a big thing. But also, you know, you're working with Chekhov, you're working with Arthur Miller, you're working with all the, the greats. Um, and finding the depths of them, you know, gosh, the, the, the things that I learned teaching that I didn't know beforehand. Um, uh, I suppose the actor does concentrate quite a lot, particularly if you're in a sort of rep system where you're, you're doing thing after thing, you're concentrating rather selfishly on your own role rather than the play. As soon as you have to teach it or direct it, you have to learn the whole play and as you as you involve yourself truly in the whole play then even the part that you once played suddenly becomes something that has unfolded a new mystery to you that you never realized when you were doing it you know at the duke's playhouse lancaster in 1976 whatever it was you know it, it, it sounds like it sounds like having a completely different perspective being allowed to look at something in a way that you you I don't think you can as an actor especially if you are if you've got three to four weeks rehearsal to get something up and running and you're doing a check off yeah. there, there isn't yeah. the to it in, in interrogate something at that at that depth so I mean yeah it sounds like you you it gave you that ability and that time to really look at that stuff and as a student of yours John um yeah, I definitely, I definitely remember, well, two things. I definitely remember you, you seemed to know where every comma and full stop was in Shakespeare without requiring a script. <laughs> you, could, you could hear a scene being said without any script being present and, and stop someone at the, at the lack of a caesura, uh, <laughs> which, which always puzzled me to begin with. I, I was like, no. Um, but also, as well, I mean, one thing, I mean, I think most professional actors would say the same in that, I think there's only maybe, yeah, I don't think I've had the opportunity to look at work and sit with the play in the kind of depth that you get at drama school. It, it felt like there were days on end where you could sit with something and interrogate it and look at it and there wasn't that performance time pressure. And I, I don't think I've had, although I've had rehearsals that might have been six or seven weeks long, I don't think they've been managed well enough <laughs> for that kind of depth to be allowed. No, I, I, um, I have a tale which, which is of an ex-student in a major theatre company with a famous director. <laughs> uh, uh, can't be more specific than that. Doing a Shakespeare play in which he said, John, five out of the seven weeks, he talked. <laughs> we talked. And they had two weeks, basically, to create a major work which wasn't very good. Um, uh, I think that time is precious. I personally, as a director, like to get it on its feet early because I do think, I do think that things emerge. I don't, I, I couldn't do two weeks table work as a director. I've been as an actor through two weeks table work I found it hard. I can just about take one week. Um, but as an actor, I'm somebody who likes to stand up and feel the spatial relationship between... Interesting, I've just been teaching for the theatre school on Zoom, and I suddenly realised how much of the feel when I'm directing is to do with the spatial relationships between people how close they are, how far away they are, who's upstage, who's downstage, who's dominating, who's, who's, who's receding, as it were. Um, uh, because, of course, you can't really do that on Zoom. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're confined to something, uh, to something which was actually quite a good experience because it means that you come back again and again to the words and the text and et cetera, et cetera. And you don't spend time creating uh, the movement of the scene. But of course, when you're putting it on stage, you have to do that. Um, and 
for me, standing up with a book in the hand or without a book in the hand, which is even better, and working out what your relationships with people are, especially if you can look them in the eye at that stage of rehearsal, that's fantastic. And when, 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 when Jamie Ballard did Hamlet at the tobacco factory in Bristol for Jonathan Miller's direction, he came in knowing Hamlet. So he could walk on stage and work with people from the word go. And that didn't half put a, a bomb up the arse of some of the other actors, I think, you know. Uh, you know. I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I reflect that completely. Um, uh, I mean, I, in, in auditions, I always, I get told off for it because it makes people very nervous. But if it's, if it's a play and I have the time, I'll, I'll learn off what I need to learn off so that I don't have the need of a script, just so I can be up and thinking. Um, yeah. It makes people incredibly nervous. Directors yeah. and cast directors want yeah. you to so Now I hold it yeah. to put them at ease. Did they ever ask you if you played the part? <laughs> if you played the part? No, because that I can understand. You see, I can I can remember doing something that I had as an audition that I had played, mm -hmm. and I realised afterwards that it was a complete mistake, because they didn't want my interpretation in a previous production. They they wanted to mould my interpretation for their production. Mm -hmm. So I, I I I brought out something that was much too specific for them. I think anyway. Ah uh, yes, yeah. No, I can see that. I can see where that would be a danger, and probably easily seen, maybe as well, by a director, perhaps. Um, one of the things we mentioned yep. a little earlier, uh, this idea of what well, we were talking before around, you know, <clears throat> it's tough. It's tough being an actor, uh, but yeah, it's it's the profession's tough. We need to be tough as old boots to be an actor, and this idea of resilience. In that, as an actor, perhaps particularly. It's about managing the ups and downs and the changes and the shifts, or anybody who might be a creator. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, and it's definitely something that I see people struggling with and over time can sort of take over and, and make what they want to do less doable over time. Um, and so I'm interested, I mean, how, yeah, how how does what you do outside of your work help you do what you do when you're working if that makes sense yeah i think i think you've you've come close to something that i was thinking about earlier which is this is not answering the question you might just have to remember it and come back to it but but i did when i was in my twenties, have an image of a horror story. I was dying at the age of probably whatever I am now. I was lying on a single bed in a garret room. And really the only possession there was a bloody great suitcase stuffed with good notices. And I asked myself, is this a life? So life sort of has to come first. It's much more difficult. Life is more difficult <laughs> than the theatre. <laughs> life is more difficult than acting, which is, I think there are actors who prefer, and perhaps I'm one of them, who prefer it to life because you know what the ending's going to be. Even if it's death, you know what the ending's going to be. You know, you, you know, you can, well, it's obvious. Life is unpredictable, life is difficult. How? But it comes first. Mm. But life comes first. What you don't want to be is the sort of actor who's only got that. Um, I remember conversation with a famous actor of the time, very good actor. We went out to supper together incredibly entertaining man and then we went out again incredibly entertaining and again you know as a company i suddenly realized that that was all this guy had that he was he was theater stories jokes 
and he was who he was on stage. And there just seemed to be a huge hollow space in the middle. Um, so I didn't, I decided at an early age that I didn't want to die with a suitcase full of good notices. I succeeded. I haven't died and I haven't got any good notices. So, so, so I, <laughs> I am a success. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, you have to put life first. And I suppose the call came when my wife was ill and I had, I mean, I, I had no choice. I couldn't just say, because she died eventually, and, and I, I couldn't just say, um, okay, somebody else can take care of the kids. Mm -hmm. Feasibly, I could have done. There must have been a few relatives, a few female relatives who might have got a bit nervous about that time. <laughs> but no, I, actually, I was terrified that somebody tried to take the kids away from me. Um, and so you have to put life first. So for me, because I am essentially a moderate person and quite mm, not a very courageous one in many ways. Um, for me, it was a matter of dealing with what life had handled me, handed me and making the most of that, which has been very rich and beautiful, but also keeping a, a toehold, a finger hold, a grasp on the world that and the things that I knew fed me so that I wasn't going to get embittered and resentful that I'd had to give up what I thought was going to be what we all think it's going to be at the beginning. Um, uh, and that worked. That worked. I get desperate at times. I get desperate that I haven't achieved enough or that I'm not achieving enough. It's very easy when you come to an age of retirement and you watch other people gradually dropping away from their jobs. I'm doing more gardening. I am doing more gardening. That's plus, partly because of coronavirus, but um, you see people dropping away and you sort of feel a bit sad um, that they're accepting just life. But then, you know, sorry, I'm rambling. But one of the things I've always admired about Claire, my partner, is that life is, I mean, she's a painter. She teaches painting. She, uh, but, but she's somebody who creates a wonderful living environment. She gardens. She does wonderful gardening. She cooks brilliantly etc etc and she looks after people um uh so so you know i haven't quite got there i haven't got to the point where life is enough where the richness of living in a beautiful beautiful area of of um of england um and taking the days as they come and enjoying the society of other people etc etc there's still something inside me that says you haven't done enough it doesn't have to be big i'm quite happy nowadays telling stories in a small village hall but i need to be doing stuff i need to be i need to feel that i'm achieving on a day-to-day -day basis that's yeah that's that's beautiful god i mean life has to come first and the, the way in which you were describing it there in, in relation to your your partner about the creating of that life around around them and the richness of it around people and um, finally uh over the course of our our conversation which has been it's been tremendous i mean yeah god it's it's yeah always fascinating to me to hear how people individually look at and work through the life that they that they have and what they work with it and the richness that definitely comes across that you've created it sounds like uh whether you've been pushed into it at times and, and and wrestled with it and ran with it when it was there to run with um but yeah the question of the day what what is it what does it mean to live well as a creative today You have to understand that though I'm still alive, <laughs> just I'm not 
I'm not that much in touch with the world, for example, that you inhabit. Um, so, for uh, so speaking personally, it is that it is that thing of being able to do it and being able to communicate it to other people. It's not enough for me, you know, there are painters apparently who paint all their lives but never show a painting. It's not enough for me to do that. I put a poem on Facebook or wherever on the Poetry Archive because something that is a mode of communication that doesn't that stops there seems to me to be aborted mm -hmm. um similarly with with songs i will probably put some songs out on the net at some point simply because they're inside me if i die where do they go poor things um they are like Writing a song is often like discovering something, rather, it's as if it's been there all the time. Um, in fact, I think it's sometimes the test of a good song. If it feels as if it's been there all the time, you just sort of uncovered it. It's like what sculptors say about, about stone, they uncover stuff. And it really is like that. Um, and, and for that to just peg it, those things to peg it when I do, even if it's out there and people don't see much of it, at least it's there, at least it's like Shakespeare. So long live this and this give life to thee. Um, uh, you know, he was aware of his immortality. I don't particularly want immortality, but he was aware of his, his immortality or his work's immortality through putting a piece of, putting a, a, a pen on a piece of paper. And I guess nowadays the equivalent of that is to put something on the net, on the, always there never ending god knows where it all goes net um it's doing it it's always doing it being a creative it's it's finding a circumstance in which you can do it i.e if you can get the money then get the money if you can't get the money then find another way um and it's putting it out there if you possibly can because it is about communication. And one of the things actually that YouTube and things like that teaches us, because there's a load of crap on there, is that however humble it is, you'll almost always find some people who tune, tune into it and think that it's worthwhile. And if it's coming out of you, it makes you an artist. John Hartock, thank you very much for your time. Andrew. Thank you very much indeed. If you, yeah, thank you. It's been great. It's been great. <laughs>